So this meeting's being recorded. The red light's blinking, so we're good to go. Um, so just welcome everyone. Um, I said, we'll get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Burian, who's gonna be our speaker tonight. He's gonna talk to us about uh, the orchids of Madagascar. And we sent out an invitation with a kind of a, a biography of Rick, but um, he chooses to be a bit of a mystery man. And his claim to fame is that he could spell butterflies before he could spell cat. And, and what's probably more impressive than that is that um, he, he claims that he's been to more than a hundred countries on all seven continents. And most of the time looking for orchids while he goes. And so um, he's been an active participant in the Native Orchid Conference for, for many years now. He's one of our directors at large. And uh, he always has interesting stories about, um, about orchids and where he's been and the kind of things he's seen. And he gave me a bit of a teaser that his next trip he just signed up for is to go to Namibia and looking for adventure and orchids in Namibia. So um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Rick to give us a talk on the orchids of Madagascar. So Rick, uh, take it away. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I do want to preface this to say that I, I'm well aware that the Native Orchid Conference is all about the orchids of North America, but we started a few years ago at our annual symposiums, including maybe one presentation on orchids of another continent, just because we know that all of you are interested in, in all things nature. So, so that's why, so this is our token presentation of the year. Um, and it's dealing with the orchids of Madagascar. Um, for, for bandwidth, I'm going to uh, stop my video because I hear that that really is very helpful. So if you don't see me, you'll still hear me. And then I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen and get started. Good, we can see you, Rick. Okay, so um, I have all sorts of things covering my screen. I sure hope that no one else does, but um, I'll move them. Anyway, to be um, very authentic, I decided to give tonight's program in Malagasy because that is the native language of Madagascar. I hope that's okay with everybody. You, you all speak Malagasy? Um, I guess not. Uh, how about we do French because they speak French there. The Dutch say say mieux. No, okay, we'll stay with English. So my presentation today is based on a trip to Madagascar in September of 2019 with the Orchid Conservation Alliance. The OCA was founded in 2004 with the focus on conserving land in orchid-rich areas of the world. And Madagascar is an area with abundant orchid species, but many are unknown to enthusiasts. The country has an estimated 10,000 different vascular plants with 90% being endemic, and there are over 1,000 different orchids in 57 genera. So that means one in 10 vascular plants on Madagascar is an orchid. Hmm. Um, for many, the country of Madagascar is pictured like the rest of Africa based on this animated movie but in reality, it is very different. Only the lemurs here are actually found on Madagascar. The country of Madagascar sits about 250 miles off the southeastern coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean, where it is the fourth largest island in the world after Greenland, New Guinea, and Borneo. It is about 85% the size of Texas, or 1.4 times the size of California. It's a map of Madagascar, and there'll be more maps. So. Uh, it shows our, our trip route. So in the middle in the black square, you can see the capital. This is Antananarivo in the highlands. And we traveled from there south and east, and then we headed a bit farther south and west, and then we backtracked a bit and headed north and east to see some more stuff. So what do you think of when someone says Madagascar? For some, it's the lemurs that personify the island. Or perhaps the fascinating flora, including the odd baobab trees of the south. 
or the bizarre chameleons with their long tongues and seeming ability to change colors. Or for those familiar with theories of evolution, it may be Darwin's observations of orchids with long spurs. But what is the history of Madagascar? Geologically, the island separated from the mainland about 165 million years ago during the continental drift, which led to the development of a largely endemic flora and fauna. The first human inhabitants arrived from Indonesia and Malaysia around 2000 years ago, followed by migration uh, from mainland Africa and elsewhere. Today, the capital city of Antenarivo has 1.3 million people in a country of 27 million. The French, um, the French controlled the country from, whoops, I missed one. The French controlled the country from the late 1800s until independence in 1960. The French influence remains with language, cars, food, etc. but evidence of early Arab occupation can also be seen. The people of Madagascar are primarily the Malagasy and they consider themselves more Indonesian in heritage than African, but because of their colonization history, they maintain a link to the other French speaking countries of Western Africa. Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world with, with most people living on under $1 per day and nearly half the children under five being malnourished. Agriculture is the primary source of income. Healthcare is a challenge and the country has the highest number of cases of plague in the world, averaging over 800 cases annually with in 2017, they had 2,400 cases. It's caused by the Yersinia pestis bacteria, hence the symposium and transmitted to humans from rats via fleas is most common in the highlands where 8% of cases are fatal still. Brick making is a common trade among um, the people. They use the red earth left behind after harvest from the rice fields. The dried bricks are then fired in giant kilns over a number of days and bring about 1.5 cents each to the family. An average of 10,000 bricks per firing can be good earning for an extended family. In the highlands, we saw this as a common site. Homes are built using, using these bricks, but in different styles, depending on the region. Most products are transported by small cart or are carried. These children are bringing bags of charcoal to market from a small village, and it's all uphill both directions, I'm sure. It's hard work. Zebu are a subspecies of domestic cattle and are characterized by the fatty hump on their shoulders and a dewlap. They are well adapted to the heat and are farmed throughout the country. The herds are walked for days or weeks across the country to get to markets to be sold. Zebu rustling has become an increasing problem. The meat is the cheapest to buy in Madagascar. The gathering of sticks to be used for fires or to make charcoal, which is sold for fuel in the big cities, is an environmental conundrum as there is less than 10% of the forest left in the country. There's a young woman in the highlands, she's putting on sunscreen made of tree bark. Another community source of income is to do laundry for other people. The vegetations of Madagascar can be simplified into three general areas, roughly dividing the island into thirds from the east to west. The first zone is the eastern and northern rainforest. This area is under the influence of the southeast trade winds, which promote cloud formation and heavy rainfall throughout the year. Rainfall average is about 78 inches per year, but can be well over 200 inches in localized areas. It is warm for most of the year, though in the cooler months can be down in the mid 60s Fahrenheit, even cooler in the higher areas. It is mostly made up of tall trees and the puce understory and is very rich in species, including orchids. As previously mentioned, almost 90% of the forests have been destroyed. Here's a picture of some typical rainforest with the mist. And we were there in the dry season. This beautiful river, there's orchids everywhere around the sides. And here's a view up from a hilltop, still in the Eastern part. The second zone is the central highlands and the mountains. It covers about 40% of the country. It's right in the middle. Um, it is much more seasonal. It has dry periods of up to eight months and rainfall is closer to 50 to 100 inches annually. It is 
cooler and frost is possible at the tops of the mountains. There are extensive areas of grasslands and there's iron and aluminum rich soils and the trees are much shorter and the understory is herbaceous. Some areas are misty and epiphytes are common. Otherwise, there are few orchids here except in small microhabitats. So in views of the highlands, it's a lot of agriculture is in this area. And trees were removed here too, of course. You see some of the mountainous ranges here. This is a granite Inselberg. An Inselberg is an isolated hill or mountain which rises abruptly from a plain. Not a lot of orchids on top of these rocks. A granite massif is a, a compact group of mountains, especially ones that are separate from other groups. This is one of the national parks we visited. It's very popular with rock climbers. And the final zone is the dry forests of the south and the west, which are mostly open and deciduous woodlands and wooded savannas with short trees and shrubs. The dry season lasts up to 10 months here with rainfall only about 15 to up to 60 inches, though some wetter areas do exist near the waterways. In the very south, it's known as the spiny desert and it gets even less rain and higher temperatures. Plants such as euphorbias are adapted to the conditions. There are very few orchids here, though there is a leafless vanilla that does grow here. An example is the Salo National Park where we visited. The, the palm forest here is a rare palm called Bismarckia nobilis. The Western baobab is one of the six species of baobabs of nine total that are endemic to Madagascar and each one of these trees can get to 100 feet tall. Euphorbias, as I mentioned, um, are well adapted. There are about 2,000 species in the world, but about 170 are endemic to Madagascar. They always um, exceed a, a latex when they're cut, and they have thorns, while cacti, which are not in this area, they have spines. In 1998, they discovered a large deposit of high-quality sapphires, and there was a big run, like our gold rush, this was the sapphire rush, and even today they have some of the highest quality sapphires in the world, and it's an important commodity. Our first orchid spotting trip was into the dry forest um, uh, Mount Angavakali. This is an example of the last remaining relic of high altitude rainforest. It's a granite inselberg. Annual rainfall is about 52 inches, mostly from November through March. And July is the coldest month with those in the 50s Fahrenheit, highs of about 72, very little rain. Um, in November to March, it gets to the lows around 60 and the high in the in the upper 80s. This is our first orchid spotting adventure. On the far left is Mary Gerritsen of the OCA. She is our leader. And on the left in that picture is Johan Hermans. He and his wife Claire were our guides, and they are probably the most knowledgeable people regarding the orchids of Madagascar. He's written books and he's describing many of the species. He's a research associate with the Royal Horticultural Society in England. He's looking at a little orchid, if you can sort of see the little white and purple thing on the side, that is this orchid. The genus Synorchis contains about 125 species, primarily from Madagascar and the Nascreen Islands, with a few on the main African continent. They're mostly terrestrials with fleshy or tuberous roots and the stems often have glandular hairs. Sinorchus ridleyi seems somewhat common in the northeast quadrant of the country, where it prefers humid evergreen forests and grows on plateaus among mosses. There's quite a bit of variation in color and markings, so maybe referred to as a complex or a group, and it requires more study. We visited in this central area um, a tapia tree forest. This is an endemic tree that grows at high elevations on acidic sandstone soil and it's host to the native silkworms. So it's important to local industry. There are some, a few orchids in the area. There's also passion flowers and this succulent, which is probably an aloe because there are 117 endemic aloes on Madagascar. The genus Eulopia is pretty large. There's about 230 or more tropical to temperate species. 
distributed in Africa, Asia, Australia, South Pacific, and there are two species in tropical Americas, and there are two Lophias that have escaped into Florida. Um, they're usually terrestrial, they have pseudobulbs, pleated leaves, and inflorescences that arise from the base. Eulophia ibitensis is found in the middle of the country on rocky outcrops, especially in tapia forests, between 3,000 and 6,000 feet elevation. In the center is maybe a new species, or it's just a variation on the same. It was found very close by, but it has very different coloration. Also in this area, we found the genus Liparus. Liparus has between 200 and 400 species distributed throughout the world. Um, here in the US, we have some liparis. We call them the tway blades. There are about 40 on Madagascar, and they have pseudobulbs and terminal inflorescences. Liparis ocracia is epiphytic or terrestrial. It likes humid evergreen forests and grows between 2,100 and 6,000 feet in elevation. If it was blooming, it's now in seed pod there, um, it would have had 6 to 12 yellow, green, half inch wide flowers. Another Passion flower was found there, and this beautiful Madagascar Commodore butterfly. Our first real stop um, for orchids was at Ranamathana National Park. This is a 161 square mile national park in the southeast with an annual rainfall of about 82 inches, with the months of December through March averaging 14 inches of rain per month. In the warmest months, November through April, the highs are about 83. And the lows are about 64. In the driest months, when we were there, um, it's also the coolest with daytime temperatures dropping to about or high of 76 and nighttime down to about 52 Fahrenheit. Rainfall is only two inches per month. The park's at 2,000 feet above sea level. Here's a view from where we were staying across the street from the park. The park is known for some rare animals and plants and was established just in 1991 to conserve the unique biodiversity. Specifically, there was a, a new species of lemur, the rare golden bamboo lemur was discovered there. And so they set aside the park because all the area around it has been destroyed. One of my favorite things to do at night is to go around the rooms with the lights left on and look for moths. And there's amazing things that can be found. The one on the right, it looks like maybe she dropped her pearl necklace, but uh, reality, those are the eggs. The cream striped owl moth has these um, fake eyes that scare away the predators. One of the coolest bugs we found is a giraffe neck weevil. The male on the right has this ridiculous long articulated neck and it's used for fighting other males, while the females use their stubbier necks to roll the leaves into tubes and they lay their eggs inside. There are 11 carnivores on Madagascar. This was previously classified as a mongoose. It's the ring-tailed Vonsira. I looked in one of my books before the trip, and this is the one thing I told myself I had to see. This is a satanic leaf-tailed gecko. These are bizarre. Um, they vary in color, but they always look like a dead leaf, making them nearly impossible to spot. Fortunately, we had some very good guides who could pick these out. You can see the color variation. They're incredible. They always have, they have these sinister spikes above their eyes, that make them look quite evil. Enea is a genus of five showy species in the Angracinae uh, subtribe. They're endemic to Madagascar and the Mascarene Islands. They're all scramblers with long leafy stems and elongate adventitious roots. Enea rosea is widespread along the eastern half of the island and has beautiful one inch long white lips and red throats. The genus Benthamia has about 30 species that are endemic to Madagascar and the Mascarenes, where they are um, common and rather unexciting. They remind me of some of our less interesting platantheras or pyperias that just have little green flowers. That, so they're primarily terrestrial. They have ovoid tubers. The flowers are green and small. Um, Benthamia africana is common on the whole eastern half of the island where it grows to about 24 inches tall. It likes moist areas, uh, 
low to mid-level elevations. Benthamia elata is found in the east central area and grow a bit taller, but has the similar tiny inconspicuous flowers. The second liparus was not in flower, but um, the unusual silver striped leaves easily identified it as liparus magnifica. The funny thing is it's never been described until um, after we were there, but Johan was working on it, so he knew the name that was going to be given to it. Gregiera afzelii, the plant on the right, is one of three in the genus found in Madagascar, while there are a hundred other species found in North and Central America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. This interesting terrestrial goes to about 16 inches tall. It likes humid, rich forests in the north and eastern part of Madagascar. Unlike our Gregieras, um, that have mottled or tessellated leaves, the three on Madagascar all have very plain green leaves. So this is the, the famous story of the world's ugliest orchid. Um, maybe a hundred years ago, they discovered something they had no idea what it was. They never found it in flower. And this area where we were, they had found, they did find a fruiting body at some point. And so we went back to this area and we um, unbrushed, uncovered some of the, the um, leaves on the ground and we found this odd orchid. And the Royal Horticulture Society each year produces a list of the new, uh, newly described plants and they gave this poor little thing this, this pretty bad name of the ugliest orchid. Um, so my photo there was actually used in the description of the plant. You see that really nice drawing that was done. It was actually won an award for its quality of line drawings. Um, and you can see the writing on like the the article is in Arabic, so it went everywhere. So that's the fruiting body on the left, and the flower is the main picture there, and that's Johan um, taking a photo of it. So that was my 15 minutes of fame. It's only, it's less than a half inch across, this little orchid, and um, it's probably gnat or something like that pollinated. It's one of the potato orchids, and the potato orchids are um, found in Australia and New Zealand and the, those areas. They're leafless, mycotrophic plants. And with, with this discovery, it makes two um, potato orchids on endemic to the island. Two more examples of Sinorchises. This is, um, the first one is Rosalata and it grows between six and 16 inches tall. It likes mossy forests, humid rocks and um, the other one, Graminia, likes is a more common species in wet peaty soils along streams, and it gets 24 inches tall. This is Sinorchis ridleyi again. This was the first orchid I showed you up on Mount Angabakali. Um, if you remember, the pattern was very different. So if you can think of Galliaris rotundifolia here in North America, um, it has lots of variety in patterns. So that's kind of what it reminded me of. Sinorchis perotii, we found growing on moss covered limbs in very damp forest. And on first look, I thought, wow, those beautiful reticulate marble leaves, that's a phalaenopsis. Obviously I was on the wrong continent, but um, that's okay. It was, it was very cool. Sinorchis newtons, as uh, we encountered it several times on our trip, and sometimes as a terrestrial and other times as an epiphyte. It has two large lateral petals that range from white to pink to rose, and the narrow lip often had contrasting colors. Perhaps my favorite orc of the chip was this Sinorchis loliana. Maybe because we saw them in profusion in such a picturesque setting, um, but maybe because of the unusual shape and the vibrant color. They grow as a, as a lithophyte primarily on these wet rocks. There's probably 40 plants here. So, and there was a whole hillside, a whole roadway full of these. It was amazing. Kyrostylus nuda is, um, it's a genus of, Kyrostylus is a genus of about 22 old world tropical and Australasian orchids, but there's only one species. 
um, on Madagascar and it flowers after the leaves have withered. It's only between four and eight inches tall. For those of you who grow tropical orchids in your greenhouse, you probably recognize Angraecum. It's a large genus. There's about 200 plus species in Africa with 130 found on Madagascar. They tend to be showy. Many have white crystalline flowers. They're either epiphytic or lithophytic. Um, this one, Angraecum dryadum, is a widespread epiphyte, has variable flower size, and the spurs are usually four to five inches long. This one was just hanging off a tree right at the entrance to one of the pathways. This is some typical forest that we took walks in. You can see tree ferns and other really interesting vegetation. Bobophyllum leptostachium is uh, one of about 200 species found on Madagascar, but it's a very large genus, about 1,500 species, primarily Asia, some in, in mainland Africa, of course. There is one found in Florida. Um, these are epiphytic or occasionally lithophytic plants. They have pseudobulbs, they have one or two leaves, and they have creeping rhizomes. The flowers tend to be quite small, often fleshy, sometimes unpleasantly fragrant, and they're very difficult to identify a lot of these real small ones. Bobophyllum sembirinense has limited distribution and grows in seasonally dry areas. It has slightly flattened through the bulbs and red spotted little flowers on six to eight inch long inflorescences. Orangus is a related genus to the Angraecums and has deeply lobed leaves in a fan formation. Flowers are usually white and starry with an entire lip and cylindrical spur. Orangus fastiosa has made it into the collector's world as a small yet showy variety with one to three relatively large white flowers with spurs over three inches long. The Rufus mouse lemur is one of about 18 of the mouse lemurs within the larger group of 110 species of lemurs. They're all endemic to Madagascar. Lemurs fill the niche that other primates occupy on Africa and other continents, and that makes Madagascar the country with the highest number of primate species. The mouse lemurs include the smallest primate, which is Madame Berthe's mouse lemur. It's only four inches long and weighs only one ounce. They all look about the same, but location helps with identity as they like to stay in their own regions. They had smeared banana on these trees, and uh, we did a night walk, and the little brothers got attracted to that so I could get their picture. Madagascar is home to about half of the 150 or so species of chameleons. Chameleons are small to mid-sized reptiles that are famous for their ability to dramatically change colors, but contrary to popular belief, a chameleon typically does not change colors to match its surroundings. Instead, color is usually used to convey emotions, defend territories, and to communicate with mates. The cryptic or blue-legged chameleon is about five inches long. They feed high in the trees during the day, but sleep lower to the ground at night. So we disturbed his sleep, but it sure made taking pictures a lot easier. The starry night reed frog is named for the pattern on the females because it's much darker. They look like the stars at night. Um, it's very dramatic. This is the, the duller male. Um, Madagascar is home to maybe 500 species of frogs, with 10% of the world's frogs being endemic to the island. They're the only amphibians on Madagascar. The little short-nosed chameleon there is about four inches long, but there are chameleons on Madagascar that are just over one inch long. We now headed um, farther south and to the west. We are now in the highlands, and this is the um, and, and the Region National Park. Altitudes start to 2,300 feet, and at the tops of the mountains, it gets to 8,700 feet. It's a 77,000 acre reserve, gets up to 98 inches of rain in, in spots, and is seasonally dry. The country's lowest temperature of 18 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded here. There's over 1,000 species of plants, 100 species of birds, and 55 species of frogs found here. We were there in the dry period. So here are some of the weirdest plants. These are the pacopodiums, and it means um, elephant foot. 
So pathopodiums are succulent, spine-bearing trees and shrubs, um, specifically from Madagascar, where 20 of the 25 species are endemic. Um, it is in the dog vein family, if that means anything to you. These trunks store water, and all of the species are protected under CITES. They're lithophytes. They have these bizarre trunks, and they live in minimum soil on these rocks. The rainbow milkweed locust is one of many locusts that causes havoc in Africa. Um, the beautiful thing feeds on milkweed, so it's toxic to humans and other animals, though this is, of course, a plumeria that was in one of the gardens. And on some of the shrubs, there was 10, 20 of these at a time feeding. So you, and sometimes we would see the kids on the side of the road, we would be holding them by their legs and their wings would be flapping and they would try to sell them to you. Reptiles such as swifts are found in these dry habitats. Swifts are related to iguanas from South America. So they may have originated when Madagascar was connected to South America through Antarctica. There are also about 60 species of scorpions in Madagascar. During the tri period when we were there, there was almost no orchids blooming. We did find these plants. The vanilla there is, um, there are seven species of vanilla in Madagascar. Vanilla madagascarensis is primarily a Western species, but we did find it in, in where we were. And it has beautiful white flowers with a lip that is tinted pink red, if it was in bloom. The commercial vanilla, vanilla planifolia, is cultivated in Madagascar. And people say, oh, I got that Madagascar vanilla. But the bottom line is it's actually a species from Mexico. The Sobencafia is only found in these hot, dry areas. We then went further into the um, southern desert area of Asala National Park, which I mentioned earlier, which has sandstone monoliths and canyons, and that those, those palm canyons, um, savannas. It's sometimes called the Grand Canyon of Madagascar, and it covers 200,000 acres. It's Madagascar's most popular national park. It's warm all year round. Eulophia ramosa does very well in this area. It grows in the dry forest and the limestone outcroppings, and it gets to 32 inches tall. The flowers are though only about an inch across. Madagascar is home to about 300 species of birds, including 100 endemics. Curiously, birds here are less vocal than on other places. Deforestation is the biggest threat to birds, and of course it is to plants too. The Madagascar malachite kingfisher is also found on the Comoros Islands. The ring-tailed lemur is probably the best known Malagasy creature and is the face of the island's biodiversity. They are found throughout the southern half of the country. You see, these two have babies. We stopped at a nature farm heading back north and east um, because we wanted to see a few species that we weren't going to have a chance to see. So this is the unusual endemic tomato frog. It sure sounds like a was named very appropriately. They can live to about eight years of age. They, live, they are about three inches long and they are toxic to predators, though not to humans. Chameleons, this is kind of mind boggling. They have, their eyes operate independently and they actually send two separate images to the brain. So they can see two different things and somehow their brain processes it. This is the brightly colored one is called the panther chameleon. And I really believe that um, George Lucas and others looked at chameleons to make their Star Wars aliens. They have these amazing tongues and it's gonna catch that bug now. Boom. Let you see that again, it's amazing. From that, um, wildlife's little place. We headed 
back to um, the East Coast and farther up, and this is um, Ngasi Bay. This is a private forest. We drove around in those um, four wheel drives and we were in the dry season and it was still pretty rough. So in the, in the wet season, it would be nearly impossible. Those hillsides there, you can see bracken ferns growing on them and also those benthamias that I mentioned earlier, the ones that are kind of nondescript. For you bird watchers, they're like little LBJs, little, little brown jobs that you really can't tell what they are. Well, that's what these are. We found our next Gudiera. Um, this is Hemicola. Uh, it's a species just found in the Northeast. There's about 20 flowers. It's 16 to 24 inches tall. The lip is very concave. And you see how pubescent it is. It's very similar to our rattlesnake plantains here in North America. Lemurella is a is one of this one in California is one of four species in this small genus of epiphytes that's endemic to Madagascar. It's in the Angraecum subtribe. It has one or two flowers that hang pendant with a rather long spur. The word panderate means fiddle shape. And this is Bulbophyllum panderella because its lip is fiddle shaped. Um, it's normally found much farther north, so it's out of the respective range, but it's a pretty distinctive plant. It's got a single flower. This little tiny thing is Bulbophyllum complanatum. It's a very small species. It has translucent yellow flowers with red veins. It's only a quarter inch across, and the stems are only an inch tall. It's growing in moss, you can see here. Eulophiella is an endemic genus. There's five species. They're medium to large terrestrial or epiphytic orchids. The largest is Eulophiella emphiliana. It has pseudobulbs up to 11 inches long. The leaves are 48 inches long, sort of like a, like a big cymbidium. Um, the plants only grow in moist forests on pandanus, which also has leaves that look almost exactly the same. So it completely blends into the to the plant until the flowers come up and they stick out. And because these beautiful rose purple flowers with the white disc and yellow keels that are four inches across and fragrant and waxy are so amazing, unfortunately they've been all removed. So there's very few left. Bulbophyllum coreophorum is it's quite striking. This thing can get to 18 inches long. It has numerous small red warty flowers that are inserted in cavities along the swollen floral stem. Bulbophyllum treated bulbum has cylindrical pseudo bulbs and inflorescences with wide lipped small yellow flowers. Still in the same area, but this is the national park of Andasi Bay and Mantadia. It's one of Madagascar's most popular reserves. It has dense humid primary growth forest at an elevation between 2,600 and 4,000 feet. Rainfall is only about 67 inches and that's usually over about 210 days of the year. There are over 100 species of orchids found here alone, as well as many mosses and tree ferns, 15 mammal species, 100 bird species, 50 reptiles and 80 amphibians. Remember the amphibians are just frogs. The day geckos are brightly colored lizards that are active during the day. And yes, there are night geckos too, a whole class of them. There are about 60 spe species of, um, of the day gecko. It's found in Madagascar and the Maspine Islands. They live on trees or they like man-made structures such as my hotel room. On the right is the flated leaf bug nymphs. This is a juvenile stage of a sap-sucking insect. It looks like a flower due to the waxy substance they exude to deter predators. I think they look like feather boas at a show in Vegas, personally. The Madagascar emperor moth is also found in Kenya. It has a wingspan of six inches. And when alarmed, it too has those big fake eyes that startle predators. The most amazing moth, I felt really lucky that we got to see this, is the comet moth. This is among the largest of the silk moths in the world. It has an eight inch wing, wingspan, six inch tails. Um, it's endemic, but the mouth has become rudimentary. So once it's 
it, it doesn't feed, so they only die after, and they die after just a few days. The larvae then take about six months to mature. The green bright-eyed frogs are another of the nocturnal tree frogs. They have large eyes and enlarged tips to their toes, which you should be able to see there. If you speak French or Latin, you'll see the root to the species melium. That means honey. And this species has flowers that smell like honey. It's a pretty small plant. Angraecum didierii has large flowers relative to the small plant, and the spurs are between three and six inches long. That uh, beautiful crystalline texture is, is quite evident here. The genus Microcelia is within the Rangidindi subtribe. There's about 30 species um, in the world, mostly from Africa and the islands near, near Madagascar. 11 are found on Madagascar. They're all small twig epiphytes. They have scale-like leaves that are not photosynthetic, and they have um, roots that are photosynthetic, like some of our orchids in the, in the south. Flowers are small. They're semi-translucent. The sepals and petals are similar, but not widely spreading. Um, Microcelia gapini has bright orange flowers and grows in the shaded, dense, humid evergreen forest on the eastern half of the island. One of my favorites of the Bulbophyllums is Bulbophyllum Francoisi. This has three to six flowers in the um, pendant stems that are longer than the leaves. The fringe, uh, the hinge lip oscillates. It's fringed on the back, smooth along the front. This Bulbophyllum's name is longer than the plant. Um, it's named after the reserve where it was discovered. Uh, it has widespread pseudobulbs and relatively large, glassy, translucent, freckled flowers. While we were looking for orchids, up above us came these um, diademid sifakas. These are large, gold, gray, and white lemurs. They live in small groups. They eat leaves, fruits, and flowers. And like other sifakas, they can move through the trees at making spectacular leaps. And when on the ground, they make an extraordinary dancing motion, which you may have seen in um, the movie Madagascar or The Lion King or in some one of those. The insect life is incredible. I don't think anybody should be touching that little guy on the left there. Those, those little barbs look pretty irritating. But the little beetle there was really sweet. Jumelia is a genus of about 43 species in the Angraceni subtribe of the Banda tribe. All but two are from Madagascar and the nearby islands. And they tend to have narrow petals and sepals with wider lips and a spur longer than the lip. Jumelia stenophylla is a stemless epiphytic species with leaves 16 inches long and a spur up to six inches long. Jumelia confusa has a lip that is wide in the middle and a thin spur that is about five inches long. The golden mantella is a critically endangered frog found in a tiny range in central eastern Madagascar. Mantellas are toxic, but unrelated to the poison dart frogs of the neotropics. So this is a striking example of convergent evolution. Angraecum implicatum flowers along the elongated stems and has spurs up to four inches long. Bulbophyllum oculatum has an inflorescence that's 10 inches long. It has bracts in three rows, and it has these small reddish flowers within the bracts. So Bulbophyllum oriflorum is called the golden flowered Bulbophyllum. But if you know your Latin, which I don't really, um, it should be oriflorum, spelled different. Oriflorum means flowers that look like ears. So maybe if you look at that one on the right, you would say it looks like some animal's ears. I have a feeling someone messed up, but I would never tell a taxonomist that. It's a really beautiful uh, orchid. It has these orange, yellow-orange flowers. They're small, but the plants we found were very floriferous. 
um, and, and big plants would make a wonderful thing for your greenhouse. Okay, and turn up the sound because That was pretty cool. I'm gonna play it again. <laughs> so what you just heard was the eerie call of the Indri. And this is the largest of the Sapakas and one of the best known of Madagascar's wildlife. Those long slurred sounds are almost deafening. They're just communicating. Um, you can hear them up to two miles away. And this is the adorable little creature. He's not so little. Um, Indri live in groups of two to six and the females are the dominant members. They have um, very short tails. They can leap through the forest like other sapakas. Um, they eat a dose of soil every day along with their seeds, bark, fruit, and leaves. And they have a single infant every two or three years born in May or June. Aranthes is a group of 40 African species, 37 are found in Madagascar. They have leathery leaves with translucent white, pale yellow or green flowers. They always have these long wiry stems. Aranthes schlechteri uh, is usually a Western species, so we're out of range, but we found it. It, was, it has a sharply tapered lip, as you can see, and a long, thin spur. Here's Synorchus newtons again, but this time it's white with that rose lip um, and it was growing as, a, as an epiphyte. And Graecum lecomptii is a beautiful miniature. Uh, it has these pure white crystalline flowers that have a long slender spur and the leaves are very linear. Another bubble film, this is Dipericotum. And this has a thick tongue-shaped lip and the flowers are glandular on the exterior. And Graecum terraphyllum is a tiny member of the genus. You can see that's my finger there on the side. So the whole plant is only maybe an inch and a half tall and the flowers are maybe a quarter of an inch across. As opposed to this Angraecum, this is Conchoglossum and it's a much larger species. It has these contorted flowers um, and they're, they have yellow, yellowish tepals and a spur about four and a half inches long. And it's an epiphyte, it's uh, quite high up in the trees. Another miniature bulbophyllum, this is Brachyphyton. It, it's only about two inches tall. The pseudobulbs have four angles and the inflorescence is shorter than the leaves. Here's another test for you. Do you see anything unusual on this tree? Well, in case you don't see it, I made it easy for you. So this is the giant leaf-tailed gecko. Um, it's the second largest gecko in the world. It's about a foot long. It has this unusual pattern that allows it to completely blend in with the bark of the tree. If someone hadn't pointed it out to us, there's no way we would have seen it. Um, it sleeps during the day with its head down. And if startled, it will open its mouth and display its bright red tongue to scare off predators. See the picture on the right, it's pointing down and the eye is now visible. It was amazing. The hotel where we were staying, the lodge, um, there's a river going through it and there's some little islands and they have um, collected, I should say. These are lemurs that were either um, abandoned as babies or rescued from zoos or injured. And they put them on these islands. Lemurs don't swim. And so they are afraid to go into the water. So it's a natural barrier for them. And it, it's become a, a tourist attraction, of course, and they feed them. And they're really very human-like, some of them. They're adorable. The ring-tailed lemurs are they're not very cooperative with other lemurs. So they have to have their very own island. The bamboo lemurs are okay with other things and they're named bamboo lemurs because they live in the bamboo and they eat the bamboo. 
Our final place to explore for orchids was the Canal de Pangolin. This is a canal, as you can see here, that's huge. It's 400 miles long, which the, the country is a thousand miles from the top to the bottom. So it really takes up a lot of the country. Um, it consists of a series of natural rivers, waterways, and man-made lakes that extends all along well, half, almost half of the eastern coast of Madagascar. And it serves as the transportation needs and the fishing grounds for the local villages. Um, we visited a small area almost at the top of the, of the canal. It consists of um, lot, lots of lush palm forests. And that's a traveler palm in the front there. And you can see several of them with those semicircle of leaves. It's got lots of pandanus swamps. Pandanus is a, um, there's 100 species of the 700 species of pandanus are endemic to Madagascar. Some are shrubs, some are trees, many grow in swamps and they often have supporting roots at their bases. Sometimes they're called screw pines, but they're, they're in a family of their own. They're not pine trees. The thin coastal sand dunes separate the lakes from the Indian Ocean. And there are beautiful white sand beaches and low forests with very sandy soils and it's popular as a tourist destination. The black and white ruffed loomers like to hang out in their lodging. Um, it's a critically endangered species. It's about the size and coloration of the Indri, but look how long this one's tail is. This is the eye eye. The eye eye is one of the oddest creatures. Um, it is, it's called an eye eye because its call is eye 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 eye. Um, it may look like um, a rodent, but it's a true lemur. Uh, it's the largest nocturnal primate that there is. Uh, in folklore, it was believed to be evil and that they were often killed as soon as someone would see one. Uh, there's a couple of unusual things. This animal has perpetually growing incisor teeth and its middle finger is totally elongated so it can scrape, um, scratch out the larvae from dead wood. So they put coconuts up at night and allow this, the visitors to come in and see it. So you can see in that little video, it's just scratching for its food. If you're into carnivorous plants, you're in for a treat if you go there, because there's two, two nepenthes. And the Nepenthes madagascarensis is actually the type species. It's the very first species in the genus Nepenthes. It was described in 1658. It has seven inch long green pitchers. The one on the left is Nazalensis. It has shorter reddish, reddish um, pitchers and it has ridges there by the stem. And Graecum sesquipedale is perhaps the best known orchid of Madagascar by hobbyists as well as um, botanists do the work primarily by Charles Darwin, who theorized that there had to be a pollinator with an extremely long tongue to be able to get the nectar from the end of the 14 inch long spur. And indeed, a sphinx moth was eventually discovered to prove Darwin correct, though unfortunately it was 21 years after he died. Thus, it's one of the most celebrated predictions of the theory of evolution. The beautiful large waxy flowers bloom in the Southern hemisphere around June to September, but in our cultivation in the Northern hemisphere, they bloom it around Christmas time. So it's called the Christmas orchid or the Star of Bethlehem orchid or the Comet orchid. They are found all along the Eastern coast, but unfortunately they're collected and sold along the roadsides. And Grea Camibernium, it's a subspecies superbum, is another very large orchid with waxy flowers, a lip about two and a half inches long and wide and a spur almost three inches long. Eniella is, there's two species of Eniella, only one is found on Madagascar, and these uh, multifloral stems, they appear lateral to the long epiphytic stems. Eniella polystachys has beautiful white flowers, as you can see, they're half an inch long, they have a trumpet-shaped lip and a short spurt, and it's locally common at the low elevations. Gary is in our audience today, and Gary was much more agile than I was. Um, we spotted this bubble film erectum high up in the tree and it took a little bit of agility to get up there for to photograph it. The influence, 
the fluorescence gets to about 14 inches long and there's about 50 greenish brown flowers with purple spots and the fringe red or orange lip. We found two species of orangus. Um, these were uh, photographed at night. So if the lighting looks a little odd, that's why. Uh, orangus citrata has dark glossy leaves and about 60 white to cream colored flowers on stems that are up to 12 inches long. And orangus elysii is, um, it's a larger plant. It has very reflex flowers. They're about twice as large, but the, the spur is also about an inch long. This is Angraeacum elephantinum. This is a beautiful miniature. It's only about four to six inches tall, but the flowers are as large as the plant. Um, what's very interesting is that this is growing as an epiphyte on a introduced invasive Australian pine. So it's, um, it goes close to the ground, but this is showing that orchids can be very adaptable. Sinorchis fastigiata is a widespread species um, along Madagascar, and it's found in the Seychelles Islands as well, and Comoros and Mascarines. Uh, it can get to 12 inches tall. It's terrestrial most of the time. It has this interesting four-lobed lip, uh, four lip and a cylindrical one-inch spur. You can see the sandy soil where we're walking. The, the whole island is, I mean, the, the islands and areas like that. This beauty is Cymbidiella flavolata, and it was quite the treat for us. Um, the first day I was walking by myself and three little kids came by and one little girl had a whole bouquet of these. And in my fractured French, I was able to convince her to take me to where she had picked those. And then I was able to bring the group back to see those. Um, there are th uh, three species that are endemic to Madagascar. They're large plants. They have a basal inflorescence. The species gets, this one gets to 60 inches tall. It has the smallest flowers of the genus, but they're still very showy at two inches across. They have yellow green sepals and this three lobe dark red lip with the black spots and they're very striking. Um, that was all the orchids we saw there. So uh, we did really well. We saw over 80 species in our two and a half weeks that we were there, um, but we were able to get um, permission to go to the botanical gardens back in the capital of Antananarivo. And they have a, a private collection in there that they don't let the public in, but we had permission. And Graecum um, magdalene is a central Madagascar species. It grows on rocky outcrops. It has beautiful white flowers. They're four inches across and it has four inch long spur. Orangus modesta has an inflorescence that's 12 inches long. It has up to 24 flowers and spurs about two and a half inches long. And Graecum pingi grows in the far north. It has yellow fleshy flowers. And Jumelia sagittata has two inch long lips and spurs that are also two inches long. Aranthes ramosa is a very variable species, both shape, color, and size, but it always is typical of the genus in having very long, wiry, pendant stems. Another microcelia, as I mentioned before, these are all leafless, or it's the roots that do the photosynthesis. This one is from the central western part of the country. Uh, it's a miniature. It has these crystalline flowers with very wide lips. Another bulbophyllum. This is Bulbophyllum teredobulbum. Actually, it's like teredobulbum, the one on the left. Um, and Bulbophyllum hildebrantii. It has upright inflorescences that are 16 inches long. It has small, wide, green to red flowers with that beautiful fringed lip. The last orchid that we found here was Gastrochus pulchra. It's very showy. It has these beautiful pure white petals, pinkish red lip, and the yellow ridge covered with hairs. It's a genus of eight species. They're all endemic to Madagascar, and they're terrestrial, and they have pleated leaves. So there's some good news and some not so good news regarding the fate of orchids on Madagascar. I just learned today, thank you, Duane, that Madagascar has the highest number of endangered species, these are both plants and animals, of any country in the world. There are 3,664 threatened taxa right now, according to the Wildlife Conservation Society. So all orchids are protected on Madagascar and collection is supposedly highly regulated with permits that are rarely granted 
So we passed roadside stands and there were some large plants for sale. Um, there are several threats to the plants in the wild, including habitat destruction and fires and overcollecting. Um, there are several private reserves where orchids are mostly safe, so that's some good news. Um, as with all rare plants and animals, if the demand is reduced, and the collecting will stop. So please, if you're a collector of these kind of orchids, make sure you know that the plants were ethically procured from seed. I wanna thank you for your interest. I want to encourage you to visit the website of the Orchid Conservation Alliance. It's just been redone and it's really nice. Um, you can learn about these orchids in the wild trips. So maybe you can go to a beautiful place like this and you could support their international efforts. They buy up land, it's primarily in South America and Central America at this point, but they have several reserves that has really kept the orchids from being destroyed. Do you have any questions? Just holler. Well, thanks very thanks much. Thanks very much, Rick. I'm just gonna, I'm just stop, gonna stop the recording. Okay. And get you to turn your mic off. I'm back.